name is Jan Georg Rosenboom, in fact, and uh, I'm a chemical engineer, as Lucius introduced me. Um, and I work in the Langer Lab and also the Traverso Lab here at MIT. Uh, my focus is really um, polymer chemistry related to sustainable plastics and drug delivery devices. And I want to leave you today with two concepts that I believe could help you be leaders and change makers uh, related to plastic sustainability and environmental pollution. But first, I want to give you a little bit of context. I, uh, and maybe many several others of you, were not so worried about plastic like 10 years ago. In fact, I was more concerned with other things in life, let's, let's say, performance of the musical arts. And uh, in fact, it was fun, but then sure enough, after those concerts, there was a bunch of plastic trash laying around. And so I didn't think much to myself back then, and I thought, okay, it's plastic trash, people will pick it up, and it's going to be gone in the trash or in the recycling bin. But I think now we've come to appreciate that this couldn't be further from the truth, because in fact, whatever we put into the recycling bin may well end up in a landfill somewhere else in the country uh, or, in the, or around the globe and reach our oceans. And so that really, I think we're all aware of what this does to our oceans, we're choking marine life, and it's even getting our in, into our food chains by fish-eating microplastics, and now we can actually measure microplastics in, uh, in our bloodstream. Uh, we see it in tap water, and we see it in beer. Very bad news for me as a German, but there's more to it. There's also there's plankton in the oceans, as we all know, and they are responsible for roughly a third of anthropogenic carbon emissions that are being stored there. And plankton is also responsible for more oxygen than we breathe than the forests actually produce. And guess what? These planktons don't actually like microplastic either. So if we tamper with those systems, that could be bad news for climate change. And on the other hand, plastic production is also obviously related to fossil fuel uh, extraction and use and incineration. Roughly, we're using roughly 10% of fossil fuel uh, that we're producing around the globe for plastics. And besides that, obviously, fossil fuel use in terms of uh, heat generation in homes, cooking on gas stoves, driving cars around, these are all contributing to climate change with carbon dioxide emissions. And so that's really our carbon and plastic footprint on the planet. Now, we obviously need to reduce that. And there's other great videos and talks around uh, how to reduce our impact with reduce, reuse, recycle. And while we have to do that, uh, the reality is many of us will want to get a new running shoe to stay fit. Many of us need to drive to work with a car that has tires and has plastic in them. And finally, there's also you know, a bunch of other plastic-related uh, items that are needed in our daily lives. In fact, I found them so fascinating over my course of studies uh, until also here at MIT, because plastic materials are really, they're strong, lightweight, and they're in everything. They're even related to sustainability. Like wind turbines, they contain plastics. Lightweight cars. And even food packaging does, to some extent, prevent food waste. But we really need to think about how to make these materials without ruining the planet. So I found these plastic materials need to be uh, implemented with superpowers. And two superpowers that they can have are carbon negativity and circularity. So now, how do we achieve that? On this graph, we see the top half is basically what uh, general chemical engineering is all about. Taking crude oil out of the ground and using those fascinating molecules in there and turning them into useful materials of our daily lives. Of course, these processes reconsume energy, so there we also use fossil fuels to power them. While doing so, we're emitting carbon into the air. And if you do your taxes and balances, basically you're checking your account, uh, you're going to see what comes in, what goes out, and I guess we all want to see a positive balance. If you do carbon accounting, we don't want to see a positive balance. We want to see carbon negative balance and materials. How do we achieve that? We basically use plant-based materials. Plants, they have stored carbon in themselves, in the cellulose, in the hemicellulose, in the lignin, in the first place. And we can use those materials and turn them into the same products that we know in our daily lives. And as long as we fuel these processes with carbon-neutral energy, like wind, solar, nuclear, and biomass itself, we can end up with a carbon balance that is negative. So, 
We don't really have to wait millions of years until plants and animals die off and get sedimented into fossils and fossil fuel. We can use biomass today. And there's typically two types of biomass we distinguish. First generation biomass is basically corn and wheat, things that we eat and that also microbes can digest and turn into building blocks that then can be turned into plastics. But those are ethically not very viable because they may compete with food. So second generation biomass is all about using what's left of the plant and not needed. So basically the corn stover, the wheat straw. And another category is food waste. And if I could have a raise of hands here, who has uh, thrown away some food this week just because um, you know, it fell off the shopping board or it didn't taste great from taking it out? And I'm not judging. All right, we've all done it. And the numbers, unfortunately, are clear. In the United States today, we are wasting 30 to 40 percent of food waste put on the table and chugging it into the bin. This could be bioplastic. We could use that to store carbon away from the atmosphere and retain it in our materials. Instead, we've been putting it into the bin, and if it arrives at landfill, again, we learn nothing's ever gone. It goes into landfill, and over there it will rot. But it's not going to rot regularly and just create fertilizer and CO2. Those microbes over there are oxygen-deprived, and they're going to turn it into methane, an 80 times worth climate gas. And in fact, landfill emission is one of the major drivers of climate change. So, Let's keep those food wastes out of the landfill and make plastics out of them, rather. In fact, there's one specific plastic I want to talk about, the most abundant plastic, polyethylene. If you look under your milk jug, it tells you number two, and that means polyethylene. It just tells you about the chemical structure, really. It doesn't tell you whether it's recyclable or not. But so, if we look at the life cycle analysis of this product, we have carbon footprints associated with each individual process step, from the fuel extraction to the processing into building blocks, making of the plastic, that gives us a carbon footprint that's positive. We can now make this exact same polymer material uh, from biomass. And we look at all these process steps as well. And the processes might even consume more energy because it's not so easy to take the biomass apart and liberate the sugars that can then be fermented into building blocks from it. But overall, with the carbon stored in the plant itself, and in the plastic eventually, we end up with a negative carbon footprint. So this exact same milk jug material we can now make from biomass. And that is a durable material. It's not degradable. And here is one misconception. Many people believe bioplastics are great because they're biodegradable. But not, in fact, all bioplastics are degradable. In fact, most are not biodegradable. We can make different structures and really what determines degradability or durability is the chemical structure. So we can make something that's very hydrophobic and resistant to water ingression, and we can make something that is, has a chemical structure that allows water to break the bonds. But as long as that's not the case, we make a durable material. And that's fine, because most applications we need durable, non-degradable materials. But what we do need is recycling. But in terms of degradation, when you see a biodegradable cup, and it tells you, here, compostable cup, many people are excited about this. The question is, though, how does it degrade and where? Because what this label tells you, compostable, it means it is degradable in a very specific environment. It is degradable in an industrial composting facility at roughly 60 degrees C, high temperature, high moisture, high biological activities. Do we find those conditions in the cold ocean water? Not really. It can take years for the exact same degradable material to decompose in the ocean. And guess what? While it decomposes, it could create microplastic too. So let's not rely on biodegradation, but really focus on improving recycling. We, no matter whether uh, the plastic is bio-based or made from fossil fuels, we need to keep them out of the environment. We need to improve recycling to the extent that we can keep materials in the loop so that the carbon negativity can remain, the carbon can remain sequestered in the materials. For this, we have basically several options. Right now, we do mechanical recycling, which basically takes, you take a plastic material that comes from the recycling, and you shred it up, you wash it, and you remold it, melt it down, and turn it into a new shape. That is a process that works quite well for well-sorted, clear, rigid plastics. 
doesn't work well for when the plastic is filmy or when it's mixed with other materials or when it's colored. This is a process that is also degrading the plastic. So we can only make from a bottle material, we can maybe make a textile, but then it will go to landfill again. So in the future, there will be new technologies coming online that need further technological improvement and further financial incentives that are called advanced recycling. So we use chemistry or biology to actually break the polymer and the plastic back down to the original molecules and use those building blocks to make new plastic and really define what the quality is at the end. That can enable us to upcycle trash and keep our plastics in the loop. Right, now you may ask, why is all of that not already happening? Why are we not wearing a carbon negative jacket and why are we not driving with carbon neutral fuels? Well, it appears that fossil fuel subsidies remain strong. We're still funding the fossil fuel industries and basically giving tax breaks to drilling companies or keeping gas prices at the pump artificially low around the globe, almost twice as much than we're spending on clean tech energy. We're basically still investing in our own destruction. So, with this bleak uh, outlook, you might say, <laughs> what can we all do? Are we just not a very small part of the puzzle and do we have any leverage? And I want to tell you that this is far from the truth. Each of us has a role to play, and I'm giving you three measures of how we do this. First, we buy products. Products have a carbon footprint associated with them, as we know, and we can choose, we can choose to scrutinize how was this product made. We can demand from the companies making them to tell us, was renewable energy used, uh, was it designed for recycling, and were renewable resources used. Our choices still remain the top driver of companies making changes towards sustainability. Two, we happen to work in companies, and some of us do own companies. Here we can make changes at the heart of where carbon emissions are generated, because it will not be to the loss of your investors. Because in the future, in fact, carbon emissions and circularity of your materials may define a company's market share value. All right, and third, I think we all have one superpower. We can vote. Democracy, in fact, can change climate change. We have to elect leaders that care about climate change and that are ready to implement those solutions needed and those transitions and legislations that enable the clean tech revolution. Because as long as the price is the main driver for companies making decisions what they buy and what they use, sustainability won't have an easy way. Recycling is more complicated than trashing. Renewable energy is more complicated than fossil-based energy. We need the legislation in place to make these changes. So, I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes. And it's not from Bill Gates or from a climate activist. In fact, it's from the former Saudi Arabian oil minister, Sheikh Yamani. He said, The Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone. The Oil Age will end far before the oil runs out. So, if he says it, it must be true. Therefore, Let's end this ancient fossil-based oil age and move towards carbon-negative materials, low-carbon energy for a climate-positive future. Thank you.